I'd like to invite the children forward for the children's time. Good morning. Hi, Mario. Hi, Isa. Good morning. How are you doing, Jack? Jack got a haircut. Looks good. Hey, Owen. How's everybody this morning? Today is World Communion Sunday, which means I get to take out one of my favorite books and read it to you. It's called The Greatest Table. And it has every page, there's a different different artist has done um, the artwork, and it's from people all over the world. So the greatest table isn't set inside a single home. Oh, no. It spans the continents, and no one eats alone. The table in your dining room, a picnic bench, a tray, a party tent, your beach blanket, a small sidewalk cafe, a banquet hall, breakfast in bed, a lunchbox, takeout snack, the circle at a campfire roast or any tea time snack. Each one is just another leaf in our uncommon table where all the guests have cooked or baked or brought what they are able, where all of us can help ourselves and all of us are fed and no one has been turned away with just a crust of bread. See how different they are? The greatest table, like a tree, is growing leaf by leaf. Do you know that the, when, do you have a, a, a table in your home that when they want to expand, you add pieces in the middle? Those are called leaves to the table? No. no? Well, now you know. There you go. And widening its canopy to welcome more beneath. Okay, let me say the whole thing. The greatest table, like a tree, is growing leaf by leaf and widening its canopy to welcome more beneath. Its tablecloth is flowering and covers all our knees. Its branches bend with every food from pineapples to peas. Do you like pineapples? Do you like peas? Not as much. I'm, I'm with you there. All right. Who hasn't eaten? Join us here. Pull up another chair. We'll all scoot over, make more room. There's always some to spare. Baskets mound with crusty breads, their soup in simmering pots, and bushels brim year-round with fruit, now pears, now apricots. And always in the company, there's someone we can toast, an elder, infant, long-lost friend, an honored guest, the host. Does that look like anybody you know? <laughs> the table talk is musical with every language shared. In every face, the thankfulness is more than any prayer. The next time you sit down to eat, the greatest table set, connecting you with each of us who hasn't eaten yet. So if you're hungry, join us here, pull up another chair. Let's all scoot over, make more room. There's always some to spare. So who can, who can help me with this? Isa, would you help me? Can, would you stand up for a second? Would you hold this end of the book and walk that way? Just walk that way. Ooh, isn't that cool? Isn't that really neat? Right, that's something. <laughs> that sounds like a parent thing to say. That's funny. That's something. Thank you, Isa. So today we are celebrating the Lord's Supper, which is also called communion because we commune together. Jesus binds us together at the table as, as a family of faith. And the other really cool thing is it's not just this church that is celebrating communion this morning. It's churches all over the world in all different languages, eating different types of bread. Some people are, are going to drink grape juice. Some people are going to drink wine. Some people don't have either of those things. They're just going to have the bread or some people are going to drink water. They're going to use what they have. But the important thing is that we remember that it's Jesus's table who calls us and calls us to come together. Okay. We get it. All right. Let's say a little prayer, and then we're going to celebrate communion together. We, normally, we would do this later in the service, but uh, as we're making this a, like a first communion for you all, we're doing it earlier, 
early on, and then hopefully in the future we will remember that when we celebrate communion, you can go out to Sunday school, and then we can call um, you back to come join with us later. But so for the time being, will you fold your hands, close your eyes, bow your heads? Uh, Gracious God, thank you for the ways that you uh, call us to come together to be your family. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me for our scripture lesson today from Acts 3, verses 1 to 10. Let us begin. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And a man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple, called the Beautiful Gate, so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever been on a train or a bus or some confined confined space and someone starts to beg and ask for money? And what does everybody do? All eyes go to the ground. No one wants to make eye contact. And I often wonder whether people's you know, hearts and minds aren't struggling and wondering what is the best thing to do. Themes of righteousness, justice, stewardships of funds might occupy your thoughts. It says in scripture that give to everyone who asks of you, but I've heard people interpret that to mean, well, you don't always give them what they ask for, but you do give them something, which I think for sometimes is advice as I've seen it played out. In this case, John and Peter choose to make eye contact, to look at him. And they say to him, what I have, I give to you. I have no silver or or gold, but what I have, I give to you. And then he's healed. That's a life lived in faith. That's a life lived in thankfulness and generosity. What I have, I give to you. Thankfulness to God. God asks each of us to use our gifts to the glory of God, and we have each been given gifts. They're They're not all the same. They can vary. They're different. But we all have them, and we're all called to use our gifts to the glory of God. Almost every biblical character, with the exception of Mary, that when asked to use their gifts or to do something that scares them, responds with some kind of of excuse why they, they think they're a bad choice. One of my favorites is Moses. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Right? Have you ever? I, I have said that in in you know, somebody said what what is your reluctance said something to me and I'll say well you know who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and they might not necessarily be church people and they'll look at me and go huh but that was and and I also love that Moses said but my brother would be a great choice right not me Isaiah I am a man of unclean lips. Translation, modern translation, I have a potty mouth. Do you not know? How can I give you glory? 
how do you expect me to give you glory? And yet God's call was on him. Esther being called to go in to, to see the king when that's not how you do it. There's a protocol. There are rules in place about how, how you do this. And if I do that, uh-uh. But for such a time as this, she was willing to step up. And then there's Jonah. <laughs> I just don't like those people. I don't want to go. Sarah laughed at God's call on her because, you know, I'm old. I'm old. But the call was still there. We all have our excuses. I read a lot about call when I took a break from parish ministry. I was 17 years in Wharton, New Jersey, and I felt it took me a while to figure it out, but I felt called out that it was time to pass the baton on to somebody else and that my strongest sense of call was to be more present for my family. But I am a first career pastor, so that means high, high school, college, seminary, baby pastor. It's amazing that they let us do it, uh, it, looking back on it with all the inexperience, 24, 25 years old, what did I know? You learn uh, quickly, and sometimes the lessons are hard. But um, in that break, I, as, as an adult, had always been a pastor. You know, who am I? How do I introduce myself to people? Because we tend to do that. We don't just say our names. We also say, you know, what we do. How do, how do I do that? Who am I now? And the blessing of that time in my life and that being called out to take a rest or the call changed was that I'm entering the second half of my ministry with a much clearer sense and a much more energetic and devoted sense of what I'm called to. When we talk about call, there's all, and in that time when I was taking a break, I read a lot about call. Joan Chittister, a Catholic nun, in our tradition, we talk about, you know, that God has a plan for you. God has a plan for your life. And she struggles with that pastorally. She said, I have sat at the bedside of people who were dying, who were just worried and anxious because they're not sure they ever got it right. Was it, did I do what I was supposed to do? I don't know. And so she challenged that, like that one specific plan that you have to figure out. Thomas Merton has a prayer that speaks to that, and I, you've heard me pray this before, but it's so brilliant. Thomas Mer uh, Merton was a Catholic priest. And this is his confession. My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think that I'm following your will does not mean that I'm actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope that that desire isn't all that I do. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Barbara Brown Taylor, Episcopal priest, in her struggle with call, came to the place where she realized we've all been, give, been given gifts as long as you are using your gifts. I'm struggling with that word, gifts, 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 gifts. Okay, but we'll go with that. As long as you are using your gifts, because <laughs> now we have the GIFs, the gifts, you know, so now I'm hearing myself say, okay, now you're going to hear that. Now that you say, okay, just... Can I change it to presence? No. As long as you are giving, using the gifts and talents that God has given you, then you're doing okay. Mother Teresa wrote, your work on behalf of God's kingdom will be better ca carried out if you know how he wants you to carry it out. 
But then she writes, and I don't agree with her, but she goes, but you will have no way of knowing that other than by obedience to his word. Submit to it, just like ivy. Ivy cannot live if it does not hold fast to something. You will not grow or live in holiness unless you hold fast to obedience. Scripture is a great place to start about how to follow Jesus' teachings and cling to that. Richard Rohr wrote this wonderful book, and if you have not read it, I recommend it to you. It's called Falling Upward. He says we spend the first half of our lives building what I would call sandcastles. We're, you know, we're doing what we think. If, if you're living in faith, you're doing what you think uh, God would want you to do. And he says, and if you're lucky, at some point, that sandcastle gets washed away. And then you're left with the question, who did God create me to be? And how am I supposed to live? Rather than living your life, well, I think God would, to really sit and wrestle with the question, who am I and who is God calling to me to be? That's what we're doing now through the discernment process. Who is, who are the people of Grace Presbyterian Church? What are your passions? What are your gifts? To live into that. And sometimes you know, the pause, the break, is a blessed gift <laughs> to discern that. Sometimes it takes us time to figure it out. And sometimes we brush off the call, like Isaiah, Moses, because we don't think we're capable. But here's the thing. If God is calling us to it, God will help us accomplish it. If God is calling us to it, God must think we're capable. A lot of people take the Bible verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, out of context. It's Philippians 4.13. If God is calling you to it, then God will strengthen you to accomplish it. But if it's your cockamamie idea that you're then calling on God to help you accomplish, mm -mm, wrong order. What is God calling us to? What is God calling you to? And God will give you the strength to accomplish it. Some of you know this. Some of you have stepped out, and, you know, you've, you stepped out in faith. And you have story upon story upon story about how God called you to something that scared you to death. And God showed up and you saw it come to fruition. And you, you can testify. Praise the Lord. And sometimes there's the, the calls where you're, you're newbies and you're just you're new at this and you need to be reassured. That teaching Sunday school, a lot of people say, but I don't know my Bible well enough. And then you find out that's how you learn the Bible through, through teaching it. To chair that committee, if other people see the, the gifts in you, the talent, the leadership skills, Maybe that's the spirit calling you. Lead that small group. Go on that mission trip. Volunteer for that thing. And I always say this, if that same idea keeps coming to you again and again, somebody should, somebody should, somebody should do something. Somebody should do something. Somebody should take care of that. Somebody, <laughs> that very well might be the Holy Spirit saying to you, do something. If God is calling you to it, then you're capable of it. What I have, I give to you, is a life in faith. I served a little church, and we did a timeline storing event, like storytelling event like we did here, and they were telling me stories of their past. And it was this tiny little church, no parking. You have no parking, but you can at least park on the side streets. They... When the, the church was first founded in 1901, they could, you know, everybody, horse and buggy, whatever, they were able to walk to the church, and, and there was no problem getting into the church or finding a place to park. But the town grew around them, and they had an opportunity to buy every single piece of property around that church for a parking lot. But they always thought, no, we're small. We can't. We can't. We can't. But then they told me the story that a former pastor had a daughter with leukemia and there were these medical bills that they didn't know what to do with. And then they told me that they raised $40,000, which was a ton of money for these folks, 
$40,000 in one year to help pay those medical. And they were so proud of themselves for doing that. And I said, well, let me tell you what I'm hearing you say, that if you really believe in it, you find a way to make it happen. But if you don't care that much about it, you're like, eh, no, we can't. But if you're passionate about it, watch us. And they were like, yeah, you're right. Pastor friend I know, incredibly introverted. You're like, how the heck do you get up and, and deliver a sermon? He's so shy. And I've been on committees with him, very, very quiet. And then on Facebook, he's hysterical. He's so funny. And I've said to him, you need to talk more. You know what his answer? Well, then the meetings would last longer. <laughs> so we know what his priority is. But I said, yeah, I could, I could you know, I'm willing, I'm willing to sacrifice that for a few laughs. He's so funny. But he thanks his sister for encouraging him to get involved in theater as a kid so that he can stand up in front of people and speak because that's one of God's calls on his life. Sometimes it takes being willing to look foolish, to try something new, to not being good at it at first. Doing a seminar in, in the coming weeks with some pastors and going to have them do an art project. Now, for some of us being told you get to do an art project, you're like, yay! And if I told some of you to do that, you'd be like, oh, no. When is that? I won't be there. I'm, I'll be sick. Right? Can, and for a lot of Presbyterians, like, can we use words? Can I write something? Does it have to be image-driven? Yes, it has to be image-driven. And what, what I'm going to do is have them create this thing. And I'm not going to tell them that they don't have to show anybody until the end. They don't have to show anybody. And then I want them to reflect on the process for them was it torturous doing something out of their comfort zone? Because sometimes God calls us to do things out of our comfort zone. I always say, if you're a little afraid, it's probably a good sign. And when we do that, when we step out of our comfort zone and, we, and we're praying, oh, Lord, help, and then God shows up, that's how we grow in faith again and again and again. And then we're less nervous the next time. Because God has proven that God is, that God is with us. We can say no. We can hold out. We can make excuses. We can pretend not to hear. Or we can say, what I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus. That's where Peter and John's power came from. In the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. If God is calling you to it, big call or daily walk with Jesus' is call, you can do it. And I do want to remind you that what I said before, sometimes the call is to take a rest, to take a break, to regroup. And if you're hearing this as push, 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 you know in your heart and in your mind. And pray on it, discern. If God is calling you to it, God believes that you're capable of it, and God will show up to help you accomplish it. In the name of Jesus, amen.